glad you're here. I'm excited to uh, be sharing my take on travel, the way that I love to travel. Um, as you probably know, this is an introduction to systematic travel. And um, near the end, I'm going to be providing several links uh, to places where you can get more information. So uh, don't so don't worry about taking notes because Christine is going to wonderfully put them in the chat box and then in a follow up email, you will get them also uh, so that you can uh, just go directly to the link uh, from your email. So just enjoy the presentation. Feel free to ask questions uh, in, in the chat window as I go along. Um, since uh, and uh, we'll get started. Now, what I'm going to do first is work on sharing my screen. I think you can see it now, right? Yep, it's showing oh, now. Great. Okay. So, um, so many windows to pay attention to, isn't it? So, um, I mostly travel solo, and because of that, uh, I'm often asked if I get lonely. And my answer is always no, I meet too many people to get lonely. Uh, my new friendships come in so many ways, but one method I use to seek out kindred spirits is to travel thematically. And now I have friends all over the world thanks to the way that I travel. And these are just a few that I've, I've met because I'm a knitter and I take my knitting with me wherever I go. So what is thematic travel? When you travel with a theme in mind, you seek out local people who share your interests. For example, say you like to embroider like these women, you would contact people locally and maybe have coffee with them or go to a group meeting and meet them and learn more about the way they embroider and share the ways that you do. Say you're a photographer, you would go out on the field in the field and shoot with local photographers and share techniques. Uh, maybe you like to garden, and so you could find a neighborhood allotment garden all over the world uh, that you can volunteer. And I have a friend that does that. Wherever he goes, he finds a garden to help out in. Um, you could, if you're a game player, you could uh, find, no matter what game you play, you can find somebody that will play it. Uh, and sometimes classic games like chess, it doesn't even matter if you can't speak the language. Uh, many of, probably most of you like to hike, and hiking uh, partners are very easy to find wherever you go. And I tell you what, they are especially fun to find in hostels. Um, and here I am in India, uh, in northern India. I met a woman from in, from India at the hostel, and another woman from Azerbaijan. And we went on this trek, this daily trek up the mountain that was near the hostel together. Um, and this lady that's uh, the shortest lady there is from Azerbaijan, and I'm actually going to try to meet up with her again. We kept in contact uh, when uh, I go to Azerbaijan, hopefully met by sometime next summer. Uh, the other thing is if you like to cook or anything about food, uh, you could um, help out in kitchens. Uh, when I lived in Sri Lanka for a while, I had became very good friends with a man who owned the cafe. And I went in and pitched in and helped in the kitchen sometimes. It was quite fun. Say you're a fisherman. Uh, probably you can find some fishermen who are willing to share some of their secret spots with you. So you get the idea. I'm going to be using these examples and many others during this presentation. But as I talk, just substitute in your own interests, in your imagination, to try to get the brainstorming flowing. And something you might do now is you could just put in the chat box what the things you like to do in your spare time or the things you would volunteer for. Uh, and if there's something to think about your work that you really like, what aspect of it is that in that work that you like? Just put in the chat box because by doing that, you can share your ideas and somebody else might go, oh yeah, I like to do that and get some ideas for their own thematic travel. So for me, as I mentioned a little earlier, I'm an avid knitter and spinner of yarn. And when I first started traveling seriously in 2014, I was on a quest to meet the people of Peru who worked with the local alpaca and wool fiber. I discovered that because I looked for people who had the same interests that I had, my travel became a very rich experience, much more so than if I just went from place to place seeing the sites or going on typical tours. 
And then at some point in a recent two-year journey that I took, uh, I realized that I wanted to share this technique with others, but I wasn't sure how to get the message across so that it would translate to other people's passions and hobbies. I knew how it was working well with mine. So one day in India, I was sitting in a cafe and there was another man there. We started talking and um, I was in the process of trying to figure out how I was going to be doing this. And so I was talking to him about it and I was trying to explain how it traveled to him. And he said, I don't understand what you're saying. And his name is Roy and I met him. He was actually from Tel Aviv, but we were both visiting India. So I said, well, what do you like to do in your spare time? He said, I love to swim. And I said, oh, do you do open water swimming? Because I have, I have a friend that does open water swimming. And I thought, oh, this is kind of cool. And he said, no. And I said, well, I do know that if you swim in open water, you have to have a lot. There's a lot of camaraderie amongst the people that do that. And you would be able to meet other people. And as he traveled around the world, because he travels quite a bit, I said, you could meet people who do open water swimming. Uh, and make new friends that way. And so we parted ways, traded Facebook information. And a few weeks later, I started seeing these pictures pop up on his feed in Facebook. And there he was in the Tel Aviv Harbor. He was swimming at dawn in the morning. And he had met his comrades, there they are in the distance, in Tel Aviv. And I thought, oh, cool, he started open water swimming. And then a few weeks after that, there was this picture that popped up on his feed. And I said, I, I wrote to him and I said, Rowie, are you swimming in that beautiful water? And he wrote back and he said, yes, it's a swimming trip. We go to different places on this island. This was in Greece to swim in between lots of Uzo. And tomorrow we do a 5.4 kilometer swim. And you can guess it's all thanks to our small talk in India. Well, you can probably imagine how exciting this was for me because it was an idea that translates to a lot of different interests, not just what mine were. So over time, I developed a way to communicate the method of thematic travel so anyone can take their interests and passion and create their own thematic journey. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And here are the basics of creating a thematic journey. First, you need to do the brainstorming and research to pair your special passion with the specific destinations that you want to go to. Then you need to, most importantly, find the people who share your interests. I call them your cohorts. And find out ways that work for you to introduce yourself to them. And ideally, you want to create a thematic travel project to take along with you. I'm going to go each, over each one of these facets in detail. First, of course, is dreaming, dreaming and brainstorming. And that's how we all start our trips, right? And But you will find that not every place you want to visit will be appropriate to your chosen theme. I did meet knitters in Sri Lanka, for example, but they're kind of rare. So since that was my theme, I went to Northern Europe and Scotland. Uh, another great place that I hope to go someday is New Zealand because there's a lot of knitters and spinners in those countries. So one way that you can do this is to pull out your bucket list. And I know all of you have a bucket list. And pick out some of the places you really want to go. And then put, make a list of your special interests, whatever they are. And then kind of do some matching up. For example, you know, if you are into fishing, uh, Scotland and New Zealand are a great destination. For me, knitting is the same thing. Great destination for me. Hiking is, you can find places, great places to hike in almost any place you go in the world. U.S., everywhere in the world, you can find great hiking. But there may be a few that you thought, I want to go to Argentina and hike, or I want to go to uh, Scot uh, Scotland and hike. So, but it's a good idea to kind of think about which of the places you would like to go and specifically Hike and find other hikers. Uh, if any kind of cuisine or street food or food is your passion, uh, cooking or whatever, in this case, I put down street food. Uh, if you want to just go and explore all the different kinds of street food in the world, then you might look at more uh, developing countries where street food is cheap and quite plentiful. It's, all, it's on every corner. The next thing you have to think about is the seasons. 
Uh, for example, fishing and hiking are kind of seasonal, unless you like winter hiking. Uh, so keep those kinds of, and going and working in a garden, for example, it's gonna be pretty seasonal. So you've got to keep that in mind when you plant. And um, I used to, I joked when I ended up spending a whole winter in Scotland and Ireland because I was waiting out the Shagan zone visa restriction. So I went to Ireland and Scotland for a while. And um, I, I kind of joked that knitting uh, was uh, a winter a winter sport, an indoor sport in the winter time. But I, when I was there, I did get some pretty uh, cool um, uh, hiking in, even in the winter time in Scotland. So uh, let's see. I'm trying to think. Uh oh, sorry. Um, So you may have to do some research. And one example, here's a story, one example of how I researched uh, in Peru to find some knitters. I was going to Puno up on Lake Titaca, and I thought, how am I gonna find some knitters up there? So I just went into Google and I, and I Googled Puno and knitters and alpaca. And um, I found the village of Chiquito, which is only about a half an hour south of Puno. And it's right on the lake. And I discovered that the women of Chupuito are famous for their knitted finger puppets. And I thought I might be able to make some knitting connections there. So sure enough, I got to Chupuito. The women were there on the plaza knitting every Sunday with their finger puppets. And I learned how to make the finger puppets. And I ended up spending hours with these women knitting, spinning, laughing, talking, telling stories. And that's how I ended up living in Chupuito for a whole month up on, on the Lake Titicaca. So there's different ways that you can find your cohorts. Uh, once you have a theme and a destination, uh, here's some, a few ways that you can do that. There's uh, interest groups and meetups. Uh, I found meetups were very useful for my theme. And uh, I did a little test uh, one day. I said, how could this work if it was a topic I'm not even interested in, which I said, OK, astronomy. What if I were in the Yorkshires in England and I wanted to find a star party? And so I did star party Yorkshires and I found right away there was going to be a star party in an, another week or so. So that's one way that you can um, look for groups of people. The other thing is to look in Facebook groups because I can pretty much guarantee you that just about any interest that you have, there's a Facebook group for it. My interest, uh, my Facebook group that I uh, look at a lot is uh, one for lace knitters and because I love lace knitting so and it has a huge following worldwide so when I got ready to go on my trip to Europe I could have noticed they're saying I'm coming to Europe I'd love to come meet you I'd love to come knit with you uh, and uh, here's my information and if, if you have time and I gave my itinerary and said and I got so many responses from people saying come with our meet with our knit group Please come and have coffee with me. Here's some yarn shops you should definitely go visit. Uh, and Connie, this one woman that I did not even know, she texted and said, we would love to have you come stay with us for three days. And she did not know me from Adam. When I got, she was in the Netherlands, and when I got to her village, she picked me up at the train station. And it turned out we were the same age. And we had so much in common. And we had, we have now become really great friends. And I did stay with her for three days. And at the end of that time, we were sitting at dinner and I kind of joked. I said, Connie, in a few weeks, I'm gonna be in Estonia. Why don't you come join me? Because she did, her type of knitting was specifically a lot of Estonian lace, but she had never been to Estonia. And I just kind of was joking. She looks over at her husband and he looks at her and he says, I think you should go. And so that time Connie and I made a lace knitting pilgrimage together to Estonia, and we met listening designers and learned new techniques and shared ideas, and they were thrilled to meet us. And it was a wonderful experience. And a fallout of this is that now every summer, Connie is taking a few women, mostly women, to Estonia every year to meet the same designers, and she sets up workshops and she sets up these little tiny thematic tours to, uh, to Estonia. Uh, from her home in the Netherlands. So that was a wonderful thing that happened. 
the other way to meet people is in specialty shops. So no matter, almost if you have a hobby of any kind, you're going to find specialty shops. There's fishing shops, there's wood, uh, wood uh, carving uh, shops, shops of woodwork for woodworkers. Uh, there's also camera shops. So think about if you, there's any specialty shops that you might visit. Well, of course, for me, there's the yarn stores. Uh, there's a few, many of them for me. <laughs> but uh, there's one in uh, Glasgow that I met uh, women there. And oftentimes those places will have groups uh, or events at their store that you can participate in. And sometimes you can even help with creating an event for the shop as a visitor. This is a shop in Utrecht that I spent a lot of time in, and we were here with a group knitting outside the store on the uh, on the walkway. Also, look for special events that uh, are in your field. Uh, the this uh, for me, I just happened to be in Edinburgh, and I did a Google of knitters, and I ended up finding the Edinburgh Yarn Festival, which is world famous. Was going to be the next week, and I didn't even know about it, but I got to attend. And another thing you can do with events is if you know far enough in advance, you can volunteer to help out. And that is a great way to meet more local people that do the things that you do. And there's a lot of more ways. For example, uh, you're going to get referrals uh, from people that you meet. Uh, one that I got from the woman that owned the yarn ship shop in Utrecht, she says, are you you're going to Copenhagen? Oh, my friend. Um, is in Copenhagen and you should meet her. And I contacted her and when I got there, uh, we got we got to meet, we knit, and she invited me to come stay in her apartment for a couple of nights when it was a challenge for me to find any uh, low cost housing in Copenhagen for a few nights because there was a big music festival going on. She said, oh, come to stay with us. Uh, so that was a wonderful uh, adventure. So another thing you need to think about is in trying to find your cohort is think about ways to introduce yourself. Uh, for example, I, whenever I would uh, introduce myself on say a Facebook group or if I emailed someone or I emailed a shop owner in advance, I had set up a web page. Bring it up here. I set up a web page that explained everything in detail about what I was going to do. And I'm going to give you the link to a resource so that you can see this uh, example more closely in case you wanted to copy it uh, for yourself. Uh, but it was, it told them about what I was going to do. It gave them a little bit of history about how I had traveled with my knitting and spinning in previously. And uh, it just gave me a, a little bit of credibility. It felt like they knew me a little bit. And I think that's why people were comfortable inviting me to their homes and to their groups. They knew that I was who I said I was. Um, so this can help people, break, this can really help break the ice for you. Another way to really break the ice is to carry a thematic project. If you want to take your step, like the idea a step further, uh, you should devise some kind of a project to work on while you travel. It's going to keep you focused on your purpose and it will provide, obviously, ways to meet people. Uh, here's a few ideas. Maybe you want to just create a website or a blog that's only about this, this thematic aspect of your travel. Uh, you might want to create just a dedicated Facebook page. Again, it's just about you write only things about your this thing that you're working on. Uh, I'm going to show you in a few minutes an example of a blog that I did that was really oriented toward my theme. Uh, because I have a regular travel blog, but then I also had a blog that was specific for my theme. And who of us who travels doesn't collect souvenirs that have to do with our passion? Well, you probably know that mine is collecting a lot of yarn. And I discovered that I want, I, finally I'd gotten so much different, different samples of yarn that I decided to start recording them and I put them on these little cards. And on the card, I put a lot of details about each thing that I bought, where it came from. A lot of times these things were gifts or there was a story behind how I had acquired them. Uh, I received some hand spun wool and it, so I, I put the name of the woman that did it uh, on there. And then really, and then, the, uh, I, then I took those cards and I taped them into my travel journal. So I have those as a permanent uh, record of each of these things that I acquired. 
Uh, the couple of really nice things about that is when I, even though I, some of them I've made into gifts and given the yarn away, I still have a little sample of it. Also, if I give, I made a gift out of it and I give it to someone, I can give them the story of where that yarn or that fiber came from, which makes that gift a little even more special. Um, so what, you can take this even one step further and create a participatory project. And this is the best kind because you ask other people to participate with you in your thematic journey. So for example, you could turn your thematic travel page into a shared social media group that's just for the people that knew me. And uh, so they can get to know one another. So for example, say you're a photographer, you can arrange to go out on photo shoots with other photographers and then set up an Instagram page that's only for those participants and those photo shoots to share the work and the techniques in the background for them. Uh, another idea is collect contributions to the project itself. For example, if you're an artist, you might carry around a sketch pad and ask people when you meet them if you can, if they would contribute a drawing to the sketch pad. Um, and then keep track of all the contributors that and and for their emails and information about each one of the contributors, because some of them are going to become good friends uh, as you uh, as you continue around the world. So this leads me into telling you about my project as a thematic traveler. My project was Hamish the Traveling Spark. This was a project that really got out of hand. But it turned out to be one of the most memorable things that I have ever done. Before my journey, I knit a few rows of ribbon to start the scarf. And after that, when I met knitters, they were invited to add a few rows or a whole section, whatever they wanted, any stitch, any pattern, any yarn. I even had ladies who had contributed some of their own hand spun yarn to the project. During the trip, for some reason, this scarf create, kind of acquired this male persona. Don't ask me why, don't ask me why. And when I was in Scotland, I finally came up with his name, Hamish, and I wrote a whole blog post about coming up with Hamish's name. Hamish wrote his own travel blog written from his own point of view. He, so he created, he kind of developed this rather snarky personality. Uh, he um, complained when uh, I stuffed him in his traveling bag at the end of the day, or if I ignored him because I went on a walking holiday and left him behind. Um, so it had a lot of personality, but I featured all of the people that contributed to him in the blog. And for this reason, as I received contributions to Hamish, I would ask people to actually sign in a journal their email addresses so they could keep track of Hamish. And also, I asked their permission to use their photograph uh, or information about them in the blog. And if people didn't want me to add it, their information, that was fine. I just didn't. So, but I kept track of that. And I think it's very important right now to do that. Uh, Al Hamish also became very much quite an admirer of all the ladies who handled him. By the time I sent him home from Europe after 13 months, Hamish had over 200 contributors. He was six meters long. He had, we had traveled over 15,000 miles together. The youngest knitter to contribute was a little, a young woman, 13 years old. She said, oh, I can knit. And she did a wonderful job. And the oldest knitter was a 94 year old lace knitting designer in Estonia. She's very well known in the lace knitting world. And most importantly, we made so many new friends. So uh, here's the link to Hamish's blog. Um, and again, um, this will be in the follow-up uh, email. So you can, you don't have to copy it down right now because all these, I'm afraid all these uh, links are a little bit long. Um, so now I'm going to tell you uh, ways that you can learn more about thematic travel, more details and get more ideas. Because I had to cut this a little bit short, but uh, I can tell you a couple of ways that I have put online to learn more about thematic travel. Not long after I visited with Rowie in, in India, 
I wrote a long and very detailed article on my website called The Ultimate Guide to Thematic Travel. And then uh, a little over a year ago, I decided to create an online video workshop that goes into even more detail uh, than the online article. And this is a four part series that will guide you, guide you through your creation of a personal plan, which will serve as the launch pad for your next trip. During the video workshop, you have lots of opportunity to stop the video and work on your travel plans as you go along. And I'm gonna give you a little trailer for the workshop right here. And I want you to watch for those finger puppets and uh, a little uh, image of Hamish in the trailer. Well, whatever it is, you can take that thing, that passion, and turn it into a travel program that will take you places so that you can do experiments. And that's what this workshop is all about. You're walking through the steps and you're going to In both of these resources, uh, that are, I cover all of the steps I talked about here today, but in much more detail. And in both methods, I provide these downloadable worksheets that you can guide you through the process, uh, examples that you can study, like that web page. Uh, and I list uh, a lot of resources and next steps for you when you get ready to actually uh, do the nitty gritty planning for travel and making your reservation. All right, here's the good part. You know, you, read, you watch these, what, all these webinars and they get the end, they go, there's all this special thing that you can do. And then they ask for $900, right? No, this is free. I love to do this. I love to share information and inspire people because I really believe the more we go out and we meet people locally and participate with them in the things that are important to us and valuable to us, I believe that that is an avenue for and so I want, I want everybody to find a way to travel that is very authentic. And I feel like this is one way to do it. It's not the only way, obviously, but it's one way. So here's the link to uh, the thematic travel, both the guide, the ultimate guide, and the uh, video course. And you can look at both of them and decide which one you prefer to learn more. So I encourage you to go out and check, check it out. Um, and on um, both of them, you can get a lot more information than I've provided here. So I have a couple more offers for you of information that I have uh, uh, provided for traveling. This is outside the uh, purview of thematic travel. But um, as mentioned, as the thing mentioned in the introduction, I have written a book. It's called Dream Plan Travel. You can learn about how I travel slowly. I travel long-term and independently. And if you're interested, and I also travel solo. And if you're interested in any of those, uh, I have a lot of ideas about how you can achieve that. Also on a very tight budget, because I wanna tell you, all my friends know I am a very cheap traveler. Right now, I'm pretty close to living on my social security check, which I wanna tell you that is something. And when I go to developing countries, I save money for my social security. So you can do these things on a very tight budget. In the book, there's also lots of examples and stories of about the way that I travel. It's also full of links to downloadable enhanced content, uh, planning workshops and lists, pertinent blog posts, and even a budgeting spreadsheet. Uh, you can learn a lot more about the book here at my website slash DCP. 
and you can see the table of contents. Uh, and you can also read the entire introduction. So it, the book is available in hard copy, but you'll have to order it from online or you can go to your favorite bookstore and order it. Uh, but if you want to save money by downloading the ebook and you get it instantly, uh, I set up a discount code for this group called BNN thematic. And again, that will also be uh, in the follow up letter. Um, and this will give you uh, the book, downloadable book, for half price. So you will, the book is normally $16, so you get it for eight, and you can get it immediately. And you're free to share this coupon with your friends if you would like, but it's only valid until October the 20th. So you'll have to do it in the next, get it in the next week. And then uh, there's one last thing that I am excited about because it's the project that I'm working on right now. I am an independent traveler and I like to plan all of my own itinerary and make all my own reservations. It gives me a lot of control. It also gives me a lot of flexibility. Um, sometimes people ask me, can I just watch, watch you while I make my travel plan? Well, currently I'm planning a two month train trip journey from London to Tbilisi, Georgia. It's supposed to start in late January, early February. And I decided uh, when I was in the midst of this, I said, oh, how cool would it be for me to share my planning process in a series of blog posts? So I have created a series called Look Over My Shoulder, and it gives you the opportunity to see step-by-step step how I go from dreaming and brainstorming all the way ready up to the point that I'm ready to make reservations. It's already in process, so some of the articles are already out there. Uh, there I think that the link is here. A new article is posted every Monday. And um, if you go to my the homepage of my website uh, and scroll down just a little bit, you will see uh, the link uh, to that article, to that, to those theories. My mom used to say that planning a trip is almost as much fun as the trip itself. And over the years, I discovered that this really is true. Even when I did not end up going on a planned journey, I never felt like I wasted time in the dreaming and planning process. I usually gained some new skills. I actually, oftentimes, when my daughter and I were planning a trip, they got cut short because of COVID. Uh, over a year ago, we actually met people who had arranged places for us to stay in Morocco and in uh, Portugal and started con you know, conversations with them. So I still have them in my back pocket because when I'm going to Morocco, I know where I'm going and I know who I'm contacting. So uh, I hope this workshop has given you a few ideas to make your planning as fun and productive as I find mine. I really thank all of you for joining me. Uh, and now I open for questions and comments so Ooh, kathy thank you so much can we give her a little virtual <laughs> round of applause that was you. awesome that was totally packed with a ton of value anyone has questions feel free to put them in the chat box or we're kind of a smallish and mighty group so you can feel free to unmute yourself um, but actually, I'll kick it off with a question that I'm dying to ask, um, okay. which is, I know you are letting us look over your shoulder on your upcoming trip, but what else is on your bucket list? Or maybe what else is on the scarf's bucket list? On the scarf's bucket list? I'm not sure. I'm, if I did, um, I think the scarf is finished. Uh, I actually ended him. I put a ribbing on the other end and kind of officially closed that project. Um, and I think I would do the same project again. In fact, I'm considering carrying a, another scarf across Southern Europe as I go, uh, because I will be in the Balkans, uh, mostly, most of the next two months I'll be in the Balkans and I will be in Turkey. And there's a lot of spinners and knitters in those areas. Mm -hmm. So in fact, I met, a, uh, I'm going to Slovenia and I've already been in contact with a woman that I met in a hostel in Ireland who's from Slovenia and I'm going to be going to Bled to meet her again. So. Um, but that's, uh, I think that, um, that is another thing, but the other thing that, um, my daughter is a chef and we're going to be traveling together and we had planned a journey that was going to be probably about a year and a half, but COVID cut it short. Um, and we were going to be going to, I love to go to traditional markets around the world and shop in traditional food markets and then learn about the cuisine that way. 
and then have a kitchen to go back to and cook in the kitchen and learn about the different kinds. And that's another theme that I have followed in various places as well. So those are a couple more other ideas. Does that answer your question? It does. I love that. Actually, I have an add-on question, but before I ask it, does anyone else want to jump in with a question? I feel like you have shared a lot of successful trips around thematic travel. I'm curious, where, where are you getting your inspiration from? Or maybe in the beginning, when you first started these, this type of travel, where were you getting your inspiration from? <laughs> well, my inspiration to go to Peru was on a yard label. <laughs> Um, I was, I, I had, I had a couple, I, before I was, I was, I was 60 when I went to Peru the first time. I turned 60 in Peru, actually at Lake Titicaca. And, um, before that I had had, uh, I had not been able to travel for many years. And, but one day I was knitting and I noticed that the yarn that I was knitting from was alpaca and it was, it said made in Peru. And I said, where is this, where is this at? And so my, actually my first place to go to was I discovered where that mill was in Peru, it's in Arequipa. And I went to Peru, I went to Arequipa first. And that was my first place to go. And I didn't really call it thematic traveling then. It was just the, what I wanted to do to meet knitters and spinners in Peru and particularly and find out where the alpaca came from. And so that was the first thing that I did to uh, start that whole process. All from the yarn label. I love that. Um, <laughs> what, a, what a fun story. Again, I'll open it up for questions if anyone has one. I, I have one last one, actually. Um, and that's really around, I guess for me, I'm finding a lot of inspiration in your story. And I'm, I've been trying to travel slower and spend more time in a place. But I'm curious what that looks like for you. And I got to look over your shoulder a little bit about your upcoming trip. But on average maybe, and I know every trip is different, how long do you spend in each place? Because it sounds like you're developing some really deep relationships in all the places you're going. Yes, it depends on the place. Um, in it, When I was in Northern Europe, especially when I got to Denmark uh, and the Netherlands, it was more expensive, so I could only stay a short amount of time. It's a lot around budget in what I can do. Um, but uh, I spent a month in Estonia, and uh, then I went to Kyrgyzstan and I was five weeks there because it was a lot cheaper. Uh, later, I was in, I spent three months in Sri Lanka because it was so cheap. I just, I got a little apartment. It cost me like $250 a month for an apartment. So it depends a lot on finances. And what I feel like if I'm enjoying myself, I stay longer. If not, I leave. But generally I find that by meeting people uh, in, the, in the locations where I'm at, I will uh, stay longer. And I, the reason I was so long in Sri Lanka was I met this young man that owned this cafe and we got to be really good friends. And it was really nice to have this connection there. And um, so that has a lot to do with it. Um, I, if I'm gonna be going to Georgia, I'm taking this trip and I'm gonna end up in Georgia. And the impetus for the trip was that I learned, I read these wonderful things about how hospitable people are in Georgia. It's like, it's almost like I've heard that they almost like when you, the, the, the border, the immigration control of the border are, have been sitting around waiting for you to arrive. And it sounds like the hospitality is like way over the top. And so, and also Georgia, one of the, I think Georgia and Azerbaijan, I think it's Azerbaijan, I'm not sure. uh, but I know Georgia, their visa, their tourist visa is a whole year. You have to, you can say a whole year. So it's going to be attracting in the future. I think it's going to be attracting a lot of digital nomads who can't make the requirements for some of the other digital nomad visas because this is a tourist visa. And I thought, oh, I could go there and I'll get there in the late winter. Uh, there's a special uh, trek that I want to go on. So I have to wait until the snow clears uh, in the spring. And so I'll stay there at least, probably at least three or four months. Uh, and then I have friends in Kyrgyzstan, so I'm going to make it overland. I'm going to try from there, my dream is to go overland from Georgia to Kyrgyzstan uh, and then spend some time in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and then again, I also want to go back to Sri Lanka. So the problem making all these friends, there's a real problem, as you probably know. They're all over the world and it's very expensive and it's very difficult to get back and visit them again. But luckily, we have Facebook and we have our social media and we have ways that we can have meetings and meet each other. I have very good friends in, from the UK and I meet with them regularly on 
uh, on social media, uh, just talking and chatting. And so uh, at least we have that. And, and I'm, I'm thankful, grateful for that. I love that story. Thank you for that. Uh, Nancy has actually a very good question I'm curious about now. Have you ever worked anywhere in your travels? Uh, I haven't. Um, I'm very careful about not, about staying within the bounds of the tourist visa. Uh, and it's very challenging, of course, to get work visas. Uh, I have, uh, I did, oh, I did, I will say this, I did go and I worked on a farm in Hawaii uh, a few years ago. So that was easy because it was in the United States. Um, but uh, I, I was a, uh, I'm a book designer. And so when I first started traveling, I was still had clients and I was able to work on uh, books uh, as a digital nomad basically before they coined the term. <laughs> um, and I, uh, in fact, one interesting thing was I was working on a hiking book for a, a small island in Puget Sound with my client. But I finished that book while I was walking the Camino de Santiago in Spain. And so that, that was kind of a fun thing that, that it was coincidental that I was walking while I was working on the book every once in a while, yes. That is awesome. I love that. Uh, Deborah, would you like to unmute to answer? Oh, you're on it. Go ahead. <laughs> Hey there, Kathy. Uh, she's on that island right now, actually. <laughs> Lovely to see you. I, my question is how you would answer folks that are wondering how you feel safe as a woman traveling solo around the world, if there are specific um, things that you do to make sure that you're staying safe, um, or if uh, you just have a standard response that you can um, help us give other people that um, might worry about our safety. Well, you know, I never really felt afraid. Now, I will say this. I will say as an older woman traveling, I have never felt afraid. Because let me tell you something. The thing that makes you feel afraid when you're traveling as a woman usually is when you're young and you get hit on by guys. And even though probably 999% of those people never would bother you, they really wouldn't hurt you. But that feeling, that, that feeling of fear is there. And so uh, it's hard for me to answer that for younger women because when I was traveling as a younger woman, I did feel vulnerable and I felt uncomfortable. I will tell a story that is funny about being an older woman traveling. It's liberating because I was walk, I was walking down the street in Arequipa and Arequipa is considered a kind of not a safe place to be. But the thing is, in Arequipa, it's because there's so much poverty. And wherever there's poverty, there's crime because people just want to eat, right? And if you don't show that you have much wealth, if you just look like an everyday, ordinary person, they're less likely to bother you because as far as theft goes. Now, most countries, the biggest problem you're going to have is theft. Just give them whatever you have if you get accosted because there's not that much violent crime in most countries in the world except the United States. Sorry. <laughs> Um, but I was walking down the street and I had people one day and this twice as I was walking down the street, because I have long hair and, and I, and I walk pretty fast and I was just walking along and twice this happened to me, different occasions. A young man passed me one time on a bicycle and one time walking and they turned around and they looked at me and then they kept going. So it's obvious from behind, they assumed I was a lot younger than I was. And when they got to look at me, it's like, oh, that's my grandmother, never mind. <laughs> so, so I do feel a lot safer. Now, when people say, aren't you afraid to travel? I go, you know, fear is really a state of mind. Uh, if you think about how many times last week you got into your car and got on a freeway. Think about that. How scary should that really be? So that's how a lot of people in the United States die. But we do it because we're so used to it. So if you kind of, you know, of course, obviously, when you're walking down the street, you don't go to parts of the cities that aren't safe. Uh, and I often, I will ask my host, is there any place where I should not walk, especially at night? Or in those kinds of things, because I usually have a host at the, at the hostel or the guest house where I'm staying. So you can find out those kind of logistical things. But I kind of look at it from the standpoint of uh, how, how afraid do I really feel and is it warranted? 
And I, as I got more experience traveling, I found that I'm less of, and less and less afraid. So it's a lot of it's really right here in your head. Wow, that was quite an answer, Kathy. If I ever decide <laughs> to grow up, I really want to be you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, we still have a couple more minutes in case anyone has any more questions. Or Kathy, do you have any questions for the audience, maybe? Yeah, I like this comment. Sometimes just staring them dead in the eye is enough to scare people away. That's true. That's Confidence true. really means I usually try to act like I know what I'm doing and where I'm going. But I don't always. It's hard to do that as a traveler. But yeah, just looking at them like, you know, don't, don't mess with me. But um, like I said, I, I really, I have, I've been pickpocketed once and that was in Arequipa, but it was a crowded bus and I wasn't paying attention. Mm. Uh, Kathy, I'm just, I just unmuted myself. I didn't even bother putting it in the chat. Sorry about that, Christine. <laughs> Jump in there, Nancy. There yeah, you go. <laughs> um, it's because I'm your age and mm -hmm. um, that I, I've done one solo trip Okay, and it was uh, it was a, it was Paris, but it was I was in a tennis tournament, so I was traveling in between, and and I hit on Paris because I was close to Paris, mm -hmm. so so that was the only time, and we discussed it this morning at the because that's what the topic was this morning at uh, yeah. the nomadic mat. So, um, but but my concern is, um, how do you even? come up with a theme I know this sounds like stupid because I don't do Facebook okay I refuse okay. to do Facebook yeah I understand and, that. And, I, and and I know that there's a lot of information there and I know that I do look up have to look up occasionally something but it's when I travel I'm looking for a spiritual experience well that's not a theme it is a theme for me but it's not a theme that I'm going to carry with me somewhere. And it can be any kind of a spiritual experience. It's just that I'm trying to figure out how you can, like one time we, we were sitting on a balcony in, in uh, Meteora in, in Greece. And oh, we were, Meteora. Yeah. So we were sitting there, my husband and I having a glass of wine. And we looked up at one of the monasteries that was in our view. And then it was like the sky opened. And you know, when you see those rays and you you get the image of a supreme being, well, this kind, that kind of spiritual experience, but that happens once in a, in a three week vacation you know? yeah. <laughs> or maybe another occasional time. So I, I just, I, I find it fascinating that you could, I mean, you obviously have a hobby that is portable too, yeah. which is, which is good, but, um, but I'm just wondering how do you find the theme? I, I, I saw what you are, but um, I still, I don't know. Um, I, I'm, I think I, I, some one of the things that I recommend in the workshops is uh, you might want to get together with other people that are kind of, that you know, locally where you live like-minded people and say, I want to think about doing this and pick their brain, you know, have a okay. brainstorming session and say, can you help me think of ways that I can have spiritual experiences in different parts of the world? And for, I had, I did, when I walked the Camino de Santiago, I decided this is kind of a spiritual thing. I have to stick in here. Yeah, very. But, um, I wanted to make it special because it is a very special place to go. And I walked the Northern route. So I, and I walked there in the fall. So there wasn't as many people. And I was walking alone almost all the time because I'm a slow walker and most people walk faster than I do. And I decided that it, I was going to make it a Camino of gratitude. And I made a list of things that I was grateful for in my life. And I put them in my journal. And every day I picked one of those things and I, thought about it during the day and during my rest stop I would journal about that thing that oh, I yeah. like for one time it was I was thankful for the fact that I had always had food on the table you know just little things that's a big one but a lot of little things and some and and then I would I would write about that during the day and I would think about it and it was very profound so you can like you, and I really struggled with coming up with that theme for my Camino. You know, I really said, what can I do to make it mine, make it really special to me? Uh, and that ended up being the way that I did that. But it took, it did take some thought. And I think journaling can help just doing some like just regular journaling and saying, oh, you know, what, what you know, just jotting down things, uh, let it percolate in your head. Um, the... But again, I think if you have a spiritual group that you're a member of in your community <laughs> are, are just people that are friends that know you well, 
Uh, I would sit down and say, I'm thinking about doing this, and you might have given me ideas. And because they know you and they kind of know the kind of person you are and the things that are special to you. Yeah. Um, one time I had in one of my workshops, it was a live workshop, and a lady said, Gosh, I don't do I don't do these things. She said, My work is my passion. And I said, Well, what aspect of your work, what is a special thing in your work that is that you love the most? I mean, there's always parts of the work you don't care for. And she started thinking about it and she said she worked with special needs people to set up their uh, independent housing. And she said, I really like, you know, mentoring these people. And I said, you know, when you travel, you could probably through your networking, find places in all over the world that are doing this kind of work and you could volunteer to go do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, you might be able to find places via different avenues that you know about um, and contact them. So I don't know if you are spiritual through any kind of an organization or if you have contacts. If you write, you read some people's blogs that have spiritual connect, you know, you blog posts mm -hmm. about spirituality or follow any kind of um, uh, people that write a lot about spirituality or talk a lot about spirituality. You might contact them and ask them for ideas too. So that's yeah I just no. that off the top of my head. no no it's it's great great suggestions and somebody just wrote in the blog too some uh, in the chat rather setting up a visit yeah no it's a good idea thank you yeah. kathy also um, i have never done this before uh and i'm thinking about doing it for this upcoming trip is to join an organization called service s-e-r-v-a-s -E and can you guys type that in the chat box christine s-e-r-v-a-s and if you go look for it online, uh, it's an organization that got founded after World War II, and it's for people who want to open their homes to visitors for two nights. And uh, a man in Denmark founded it as uh, he considered if we could all get to know one another, that again, this would be an avenue to peace because we would understand each other and see each other as real people. And he never wanted to see another war like that again. And so service is still a huge organization and uh, you can con you can become a member and then you're, everybody's vetted uh, and you can um, then meet people. And, and the idea is to have a meeting of uh, correspond uh, kind of where you have a lot of community and you could, you know, put in your profile on service. I'm looking for this kind of experience in my travels and you might be able to meet people that way. I love that. So many great ideas. Can we give Kathy another virtual round of applause? Thank you for that, Kathy. And thanks for all the awesome questions. I just dropped into the chat again, all of the links that she shared. So you guys can have that as a resource for after this. You're presentation was packed with info. Um, I feel bad for Nancy, who's now seen me twice today because I've been hosting these events all day. But actually, that's important as to this slide. If you missed any of these events or even this event, if you missed the beginning or you want to replay, you can get replays of all the events by becoming a plus member with the Nomadic Network. So that's something that's available to you. And then also, don't forget, there's so many events happening all the time. And so there's uh, a lot more coming up in the coming weeks. And a shameless plug, I will be very excitedly talking about drones in November. I did a workshop a few months ago, so I'll be back um, next month. And then there's also the book club. So don't forget about the book club. Um, but this was so, so much fun. Thank you again, Kathy, for your time. Thank you.